quantum mechanics is filled with weird counterintuitive concepts like wave particle duality, quantum tunneling, and countless others. Because of this, it has rightly earned the reputation of being a very difficult subject. But I'm going to let you in on a little known fact. There are only five basic axioms or postulates that underlie quantum mechanics. And knowing these axioms can turn the seemingly jumbled mess of the theory into a simple, coherent unity. My goal in this video is to teach you these five axioms and along the way highlight why having a good grasp of linear algebra is absolutely pivotal if you truly want to understand the theory. Now before I begin, I'd like to note that these axioms are not meant to be understood in the mathematical sense as rules from which every result logically follows. Instead, I recommend conceptualizing them in your mind as the general principles of how quantum mechanics works. These principles will range from covering basic physical concepts like the state of a system to more abstract concepts like the Born Rule. Okay, so let's get to those axioms. The first axiom says, the state of a physical system is described by a vector in a complex Hilbert space, which we label as H. There are three key linear algebra concepts here. The first is that of a vector. The second is that of a Hilbert space. And the third is what it means for a Hilbert space to be complex. In quantum mechanics, a vector is not the arrow and space vector that appears throughout intro physics courses. Rather, it is an abstract mathematical vector and in this case, one that lives in something called a Hilbert space. In most quantum textbooks or papers you might read, these vectors will go by the name of Ketz. That's just the standard conventional terminology. Okay, so what is this Hilbert space that these vectors live in? I plan to make a future video explaining Hilbert spaces in detail, but for our purposes here, we can consider a Hilbert space as a generalization of a vector space, and more specifically, one that is equipped with something called an inner product. This basically means that there's some way of measuring distance between vectors. So what does it mean for a Hilbert space to be complex? This means that the field underlying the Hilbert space is the complex numbers. So if we scale the length of any vector in the space, or if we take a linear combination of some vectors, then the values we use will be complex numbers. One final note about vectors. Since the state of a system generally changes over time, these will be time dependent. So that's it for the first axiom, which tells us how to describe states. The next thing we'd like to do is to find a way to describe the actual physical, measurable quantities of the system. These can be quantities like velocity, momentum, or energy. In quantum mechanics, these quantities are referred to as observables. And the second axiom tells us how we can mathematically describe them. This axiom says that the observables of a physical system are described by something called self-adjoint linear operators. And these operators act on the Hilbert space. So linear algebra is showing up here again, first in the concept of an operator, and secondly in the description of an operator as being linear and self-adjoint. So let's tackle the concept of an operator first. What is it? An operator is simply a mapping between two spaces. So it does something similar to what a function does except in this case, the inputs and outputs are actually functions themselves. So any given operator A will map one function to another function. Okay, so what about an operator being linear? There are two basic requirements for this. First, if you have two functions, let's call them F and G, and you first add them together and then apply the operator, this is equal to applying the operator to each individual function first and then adding after. The second requirement is that if you take a function, multiply it by some scalar, and then apply the operator, this must be equal to applying the operator first and then multiplying by some scalar. If both of these requirements are satisfied, then we say that the operator A is linear. Otherwise, it is nonlinear. Okay, that's simple enough, but now what in the world does it mean for a linear operator to be self-adjoint? To answer this, we need to introduce the adjoint of an operator. An adjoint of an operator A is defined as the operator A dagger with the following property. If you apply a to f and take the inner product with g, this is equal to applying the adjoint of a to g and then taking the inner product with f. So the adjoint of a is the operator that satisfies this equation. To get some intuition for this, I prefer to think of it in the following manner. Let's say we have two functions f and g. 
And suppose we apply this linear operator a to the function f. This results in a new function af. Now if we want to measure the distance between af and g, we would take the inner product. And this would be some number. Now the adjoint of a would then be the operator a dagger that can be applied to g and which also happens to be the same distance away from f. Now what it means for an operator to be self-adjoint is that a dagger actually equals a. So in the context of quantum mechanics, only those specific operators that have this quality of being self-adjoint have the potential to be used to describe the observables of a physical system. And the functions that these operators will act on will be the vectors of the Hilbert space, which we know by the first axiom describe the states of a physical system. So why do we need all this talk about self-adjointness? This will become clear with the next axiom. Axiom 3 says that whenever we measure a physical quantity that is described by some operator, the only possible result is one of the eigenvalues of the operator. Again, here we have another linear algebra concept showing up. Things that are called eigenvalues. So an eigenvalue is a scalar, which is usually denoted by lambda, that satisfies this equation. AF equals lambda F. So basically this is saying that if you apply the linear operator to a function, then this is the same as just scaling the function by its eigenvalue lambda. And again, in quantum mechanics, these functions will be the vectors in the Hilbert space. This equation typically won't work for just any old vector living in the Hilbert space. It will only work for some of them, and we'll call those special vectors eigenvectors, which you'll see will show up in axiom 5. So now we are in a position to see why we wanted our linear operators in axiom 2 to be self-adjoint. It is because an extremely important aspect of self-adjoint linear operators is that all of their eigenvalues are real numbers. Now this makes sense because whenever we make a measurement in the lab, we get some sort of real number in whatever the appropriate units of the quantity is. We measure physical observables like momentum or energy, so it simply wouldn't make any sense to have a result that is a complex number. And so linear operators that are not self-adjoint would not be adequate to describe quantum mechanical systems. Okay, so now that we have a way to describe the states, observables, and possible measurement results of a physical system, the next thing that would be useful is to know how to describe the way the system moves or changes as time passes. So we need an equation that can describe this motion, and that is what the famous Schrodinger equation does. Remember, this state is a vector that lives in the Hilbert space. The left-hand side of this equation tells us that its derivative, or rate of change over time, if you multiply it by this constant out in front, is equal to some operator h times itself. This operator is called the Hamiltonian operator, and it represents the total energy of the system. Now for the final axiom. This axiom commonly goes by the name of the Born rule. It says that if you have two eigenvectors psi and phi of an observable a with eigenvalues lambda 1 and lambda 2, then you can form another state by taking a linear combination of the two. This is what is known as superposition in quantum mechanics. And recall that axiom 3 told us that the only possible results of a measurement are eigenvalues. So when you measure A, you can get either lambda 1 with this probability or lambda 2 with this probability. So those are the five basic axioms or postulates of quantum mechanics. If you can understand these physical principles, and the underlying math of linear algebra, I really believe that you will have a solid foundation for gaining a deep understanding of quantum mechanics. Over the next series of videos in this playlist, I plan to build on this foundation by covering a few more key concepts, and I'll also go through some examples of how exactly we can apply these principles when solving problems.